Hi, I'm Eric Bowling in for Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. We're going to get right to our top story, Donald Trump versus the media. Mr. Trump has sought to make peace with the media this week after a blistering campaign inviting big TV wig, big wigs to Trump Tower and sitting down for an interview at the New York Times headquarters. But the hostility from the media hasn't stopped. President-elect Trump has denounced white supremacist groups several times, but that hasn't stopped the mainstream press from incessantly bringing up the topic. Here's Republican National Committee spokesman Sean Spicer on CNN yesterday. Should he go out and deliver a speech specifically denouncing these neo-Nazis, these white supremacists? When is it going to be enough? He has condemned everyone that's come out and supported him, every group that supported him. At some point, you've got to take, you know, his position and, and go move on. But he, he doesn't seem to go out of his way to express his outrage over people uh, hailing him with Nazi salutes. Why doesn't he do that more dramatically, if you will, and make it clear he wants no part of these people? I, because I think it's asked and answered, Wolf. You've asked me eight, quiet, eight times the same question. I've told you what his position is. It's the news media over and over and over again asking the same question. Meanwhile, a short time ago, President-elect Donald Trump again went around the traditional media and made a pitch directly to the American people in a Thanksgiving message. We've just finished a long and bruising political campaign. Emotions are raw and tensions just don't heal overnight. It doesn't go quickly, unfortunately. But we have before us the chance now to make history together, to bring real change to Washington, real safety to our cities, and real prosperity to our communities, including our inner cities. So important to me and so important to our country. But to succeed, we must enlist the effort of our entire nation. Joining us now for reaction from Stanford, Connecticut, is Ari Fleischer, who served as White House press secretary under George W. Bush. Ari, thanks for joining us. So, you know, I look back maybe 10 or 12 days ago, President-elect Donald Trump looked into the 60 Minutes camera and said, stop it. He was disavowing the alt-right. He was disavowing bigotry. And then just yesterday, he gets asked time and time again by the New York Times reporters, hey, will you disavow? And he disavowed. How much right. more do they want? What, what is the, the, you know, the, the love affair of the left with this alt-right movement scandal or controversy? Well, it's deeper than that. Look, the press swooned over Barack Obama, and they're in despair over, over Donald Trump. And that's what's driving all this. Compare it to what happened in 2008 when Louis Farrakhan, the head of the Nation of Islam, endorsed Barack Obama when he was running in the Democratic primary. Farrakhan explicitly came out for Obama. Obama repudiated it, said he wasn't interested in his endorsement. But then he said, Barack Obama did, I can't say to somebody that he can't say that he thinks I'm a good guy. Now, do you remember, Eric, did the press go nuts about Farrakhan and Obama in 2008? Did they demand every interview that Obama repudiate Louis Farrakhan? It was barely a blip in the press's radar compared to this. And, and I, would, I would argue these two groups are the mirror opposite of each other. So why did the press do it to the right? They did it to the left because they support the left. They oppose Donald Trump. Uh, on the Farrakhan issue, Keith Ellison is, is running and wants to be the head of the DNC. He wrote positive things about Louis Farrakhan in the past, but you wouldn't hear that in the, in the liberal mainstream media. Let me move on a little bit. Monday, the USA Today wrote a piece, a very high-profile piece at the top of their website, comparing the election of Donald Trump to three moments in American history. And listen to what they were. The Civil War, the assassination of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and Nixon's resignation. Now, those are the things that you're, you're comparing, you know, the next president to? This, this, is, what, this right. is how they see this? That's what I mean. They're in despair. Look, think about it this way, too. They describe Barack Obama's presidency as historic because the first African-American elected. If Hillary won, it also would have been called historic first woman. Donald Trump's the first businessman, the first outsider. Are they calling Donald Trump's election historic? No, they're calling it pretty much the opposite, whatever they can say about it being a, a continuation of tragedy. This is what happens when you have a press corps that consists almost entirely of Democrats and liberals passing judgment about these events. It's why Barack Obama had a honeymoon that lasted almost his entire presidency, and Donald Trump won't get one at all. Well, I would say, so Donald Trump yesterday went over to the New York Times. He went to the New York Times to meet and greet and actually was, you know, gracious enough to do an on-the-record meeting. Part of that meeting was on the record. Wow, that was amazing. Will he now get a fair shake from the New York Times? Oh, no, he won't get a fair shake from anybody in the media. Look, the media is already fired up to oppose virtually all that he does. 
And you can see that in the negative headlines. You can see it in the tenor and the tone in which he is covered and get used to it. There is going to be no cordial relationship between Donald Trump and the press. The same type of coverage they used during the campaign is what they're going to use now. What intrigues me is how Donald Trump has a unique ability to push back and fight back, and in large part because the press has made themselves so unpopular throughout the country. According to the Gallup poll, they have the lowest approval rating and trust ratings from the American people in Gallup's polling history. So when the press brings this on themselves, it's not a surprise that when Trump punches back, most of the American people don't agree with the press corps. The press has isolated itself. It's made itself out to be a group that we have to depend on in this country for the First Amendment and to keep a government in check, including to keep Donald Trump in check. I believe in that goal of the press. But they've lost too much of their credibility to do it, and they've lost too many of the American who, people who, along the way. Who needs whom more? I know we need, both need each other, but who needs whom more? Does Donald Trump need the press on his side, or does the press need to at least... It, look at what he's doing. He's, he's already gone around. Right. Uh, he's, his first policy uh, delivery was uh, via videotape on Facebook, I believe, and this one as well. Who needs whom more? You know, time and technology change everything. You're in the Bush administration. If we released a video like that, we couldn't have because it would have been perceived as government propaganda because there was no Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or other platforms to carry that message. We had to go through the media. Barack Obama has paved the way for Donald Trump to go around the media. President Obama took advantage of technology, properly so, to put out a lot of messages himself and to ignore the White House press corps. That's only going to grow even more pronounced as Donald Trump takes control of those same technologies and tools left behind at the White House. So yeah, he's going to be able to go around the White House press corps a lot. What's fascinating again, though, is Donald Trump also goes through the press corps. Interview with the New York Times, interview with the Wall Street Journal, interview with 60 Minutes. Trump has this fascinating ability yeah, yeah. to go around them and go through them He's, and complain yeah. about them at the same time. He's able to work them very, very well. I'm going to say thank you very much. Election Day is just over two weeks past, and the recriminations are in full force. In the state of New Mexico, one CEO has announced that he will no longer do business with Trump supporters. Not just people who voted for Trump, but all Republicans, indeed anyone who has said a kind word about the president-elect. They're all morally tainted, he says, and they're not welcome at his Internet marketing company. The owner of that company, Matt Blanchfield, joins us now. Matt, thanks a lot for coming on. I got to say... Thank you for having me. One thing I appreciate about the statement that you issued is that it's totally straightforward. There's nothing stealthy or feline about it. You're just, you're out there. You're saying what you think, and I, and I do respect that. But it does seem like well, you are saying of Trump voters, you're not just wrong, but you're bad people. Is that what you're saying? That is not my intention. No, I don't believe that. Uh, the majority of Trump voters are bad people. I believe that uh, most people are probably um, ignorant of what the reality of their vote actually means. Hmm. So then why wouldn't you do business with people who are just wrong? I mean, I think most of us feel that way when we vote. We feel passionately about our position. We acknowledge others feel the same way about theirs. But we can still kind of come together in the public square. We don't need to exclude them from our lives. I. I've I understand what you're saying. I believe that the moral principle is so large in this particular situation that people um, who believe in what's right need to stand up and ignorance of evil and ignorance of injustice is not a um, justification to be part of it. Right. So anyone that supports Trump um, by omission or by commission are not welcome to do business in my company. Well, I mean, I'm sure you see the irony here, and I can't be the first person to point out that in the name of inclusiveness, you're excluding people, and in the name of tolerance, you're being intolerant. Has that occurred to you? I, I, I've not made the claim that I'm trying to be inclusive or that I'm trying to be tolerant. I am not tolerant of bigotry. I'm not tolerant of fascism. I'm not tolerant of sexism. I'm not tolerant of a many um, immoral behaviors in this world, and I'm not attempting to be tolerant of them. So, we, I mean, a couple questions, but you say fascism. I mean, you don't really believe that. If you believe that Trump was a fascist dictator, then you would organize an actual resistance to him. I mean, you would, you would be Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I, you would I, be fighting against him, for real. I absolutely believe that Trump is a fascist, and Hitler was elected legally. Uh, Putin was elected legally. Trump has been, uh, well, it appears that the Electoral College will elect him soon. Um, he lost the majority vote. Uh, the popular vote, but uh, it appears that uh, the election that was rigged against him, he'll be able to have less votes than his opponent and take office. I find that quite ironic. Um, but, you know, I absolutely believe that Trump is a fascist, and I believe his actions thus far are indicative of what a fascist does. 
Well, then why wouldn't you take up arms against him? If you really believe the country is being uh -huh. taken over by someone you just compared to Hitler, then that's, I mean, that's like the worst thing that could ever happen. That's correct. I believe that this interview right now is the first step that I'm able to make to do so. I've received probably 50 death threats, threats against my children, threats to burn my business down, threats to, uh, against my, empl my employment. I've, right. uh, my phone, my business uh, email has not stopped um, from people singing Hitler songs and uh, claiming well, that they're the KKK. I mean, and I don't think and any normal person, any normal person would agree with any of that. But I just. I mean, but also, I mean, if, if you are decrying the climate of rage and intolerance, aren't you adding to it? I mean, you're saying you want to do business with Trump supporters. Would you have them into your home? Would you eat with them? Would you use the same water fountain as they do? I, I, I guess my question for you is, if you were a member of the Nazi party in the 40s in, Hitler, in Hitler's day, would you have done business with Nazi party members? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not living in the 40s, and, and the Nazi party doesn't exist in the United States. So I'm asking you a specific question about what's going on now. Donald Trump was just elected president. You're saying you're not doing business with his supporters. And my question is, to what degree will you take it? Will you, will you eat with them? Would you allow a Trump supporter in your home? Would I allow a Trump supporter in my home? Yes, I would, I would have no problem talking with Trump supporters. I work with Trump supporters. I interact with Trump supporters. But right. as a citizen of the United States, I'm with, fully within my legal rights and within the state I, I actually live in. There is nothing illegal about me choosing to not do business with someone who supports someone I believe to be a dictator, um, and, that I believe and to that be is, a fascist. That is, legal. that is legal, but do you think it's okay? I mean, as a, as a principle, do you think I, it's okay I, I, for people to refuse to do business with others they disagree with? You think that's all right? Absol absolutely, and I guess I think that you sidestepped my question when I asked if you would have done business with Nazi party members in the 40s, because that's something that you're obviously an educated, intelligent person. You can determine if you would have done so. And your well, failure to answer that, I think, is indicative of your position. Well, I was doing it out of politeness to you because it's such a ludicrous comparison. I didn't want to humiliate you by pointing that out, but I'll do so now since you pushed it. That is an absurd thing to say. And, of course, there's no comparison at all. Um, but if we could just move Wait, beyond you, that, you explain just to, said, explain, to, ex explain to me the absurdity well, it, in my it, statement, sir. The, that Trump is Hitler? I mean, I think it's self-discrediting. I mean, there's nothing about I did, it's not, I didn't say Trump. I didn't say Trump was, okay. I didn't say Trump was Hitler. I said Trump is a fascist. Right, okay. I doubt you could define the term, but let me just get to specifics here. You say it's okay. Well, then why don't you, then, you, then, why don't you then why don't you educate me? Then educate me with the term because obviously the, the hundreds you're the one of people that have attacked out, me today. You're, you're the one throwing out the term fascist. What, what, a, just get, what an authoritarian to, dictator? What, what an authoritarian dictator is? I'm quite aware of what the definition is. I'm quite aware right. of what okay. a fascist is. I'm quite aware of what fascism means. I'm quite aware of all of these definitions. And the reality is, is that his behavior, even with the top media experts or leaders of the country just two days ago was a totally authoritarian Look, behavior I, I under, when he brought I under, him to I, his ivory tower. When he brought okay. his, let me finish. When he brought him to his ivory tower and berated the United States press and set the precedent that if you resist him, that he will, uh, uh, <laughs> he, didn't even, he didn't even have the moral turpitude to do it openly. So first you're trying, you're trying my patience here. Press. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry, because what you're doing is belittling historical reality. Being rude to news anchors who make $3 million a year is not the same as rounding up an entire ethnic group and killing them or invading <laughs> Poland. It's just not. And so for you to say that really does sort of diminish actual historical crimes. But again, I don't want to dwell on that because I think it diminishes you uh, by doing so. Let me just, I want to get to this point because I, I think it's meaningful. Feel free, you feel, said, free to diminish me, feel free to diminish me as much as you want. You're, you're doing it to yourself. Look, I think it's totally valid to not like Trump, and I think it's valid to be mad at people who voted for him. I'm, I'm not denying your right to do that. But if we were living in a fascist dictatorship, our men would appear behind you and drag you off the screen. So let's not sort of overstate the reality of modern America. But let me ask you this. The left has argued okay. consistently well, sir, I'm not, that I'm, it maybe, is not maybe, allowable. Maybe you do need, maybe you'd, Maybe you do need to look at your history because that's not exactly how Hitler began. That's not exactly how Putin began. Okay. There are many okay. elected dictators that didn't start off by dragging people away the first day because that's okay. not how it works. You might want to do some reading of history yourself. Okay. I'm, I'm, I, I think we're, we're veering into hysteria here. But let me just ask you this one question because, again, finally, I think it's important. The left has argued consistently for the past eight years that if you disagree with somebody, his behavior or beliefs, you are not allowed to decline to do business with him. That is discrimination. And you've seen it in a famous case over wedding I, cakes I and not, gay marriage. I do not claim, and yet you're saying claim, that's totally fine. I don't claim to speak for the left. I don't claim to speak for any group. Oh, I don't claim to speak right. for an organization. I claim to speak for myself. And I right. believe that standing up against justice is the foundation of what our country is all about. 
I believe having the moral turpitude to stand up against the masses is what a citizen and a patriot actually does. I believe that having the courage to risk your business, the courage to risk your reputation, the courage to risk your physical well-being against mass hysteria to choose one of your terms is absolutely what is mandated by our Constitution if you want to adhere to it properly. Boy, you are on a moral vanity trip like I've never seen. Has it occurred to you that every rich, famous person, fashionable person in America agrees with you? That you're taking no risk at all? That, that in fact, that, you're, that, people that like you argument, are celebrated that, that in every argument, American, American argument, newspaper and award ceremonies? I mean, I mean come the, on. The, 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 the argument you just made was absurd. It is irrelevant. Uh -huh. Reality is irrelevant what people of position and power and wealth believe to be the case. Once upon a time, all of the wealthy and powerful people believed the earth was flat. They were incorrect regardless of their own personal beliefs. Matt, I'm exactly just saying you're not taking a huge and risk in doing this, other than discrediting yourself and embarrassing yourself okay. in front of your neighbors. Hey, excuse me, sir. How many death threats have you received today? I, you know, I don't know. I, I'm out of time. Hard to see you as a victim. I, I do admire you for saying what you think in I public. I'm I don't always think, for I don't that, think even I'm a victim. I'm not, I'm not, a, well, I'm not a victim in any way, shape, or form. I am okay. not a victim, well, and I've never claimed to be a victim. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Matt. I appreciate your coming on. Appreciate it. In the impact segment tonight, some big announcements today from President elect Donald Trump. He intends to nominate South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. Betsy DeVos, a strong supporter of school choice, is Mr. Trump's pick for Secretary of Education. And reports are swirling about whether Dr. Ben Carson will become Trump's nominee for Secretary of Housing and Ur Urban Development. While the Trump team has been making these decisions, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Congressman Elijah Cummings, both Democrats, sent a letter to the Government Accountability Office requesting a review of Trump's, quote, chaotic, unquote, transition. What's this all about? Joining us now to tell us the real story is Anthony Scaramucci, a member of the Trump Presidential Transition Team Executive Committee. Good to have you. Great time to have you. Congratulations on some, some announcements. Nikki yeah, Haley, no, Betsy great. DeVos, yeah, uh, and, possibly uh, Ben Carson. You want to tell us about Ben Carson? That, right? Diversity. Yeah. Um, uh, Non-ideological problem solvers, uh, people with great resumes, great backgrounds. And Mr. Trump is being very deliberate about who he's picking, Eric. And so he's going through a whole full-scale process on these people. And I don't understand the whole notion of the chaotic. You know Kellyanne. You know Steve Bannon. You know me personally. Uh, there's been noth nothing like that. Know, Ryan, it, it seems very, yeah. very, uh, very orderly, very well thought out. out. Um, and also bridge building. We're, re we're reaching out to so many different people you, to send a message that he is going to be president for everybody. You have a, a close relationship with Mitt Romney. Mm -hmm. I do. Tell us about what's going on there. I mean, people have said it's Secretary of State. It's yeah. Maybe it should be VA. Maybe it should be something else. Is well, he really I, in, uh, on the very, very short list well, of Secretary listen, of State? You, listen, you have to take uh, uh, Vice President-elect Pence at his word that he's being seriously considered for Secretary of State. What I love about Mr. Trump, the president-elect, is that he has got a bridge open to everybody in the community. He sent a message to us at the executive transition team level that we want A-plus-plus players on the team. And Governor Romney is an A-plus-plus player. And so, yes, there's a little bit of soreness from the campaign rhetoric well, from yeah. many of the people, from the but, people not, from, but not from, from Mr. From Trump. From Mike Huckabee, he made, a, sure. he made a comment. Also, Newt Gingrich said mm -hmm. that they, he... Mm -hmm. There are, but I think he said there are 100 people who would be better suited, or he'd I, rather see, I think I respect, he said. I respect both of those guys, and they have the right to say that because they were in the foxhole with us fighting the good fight. Those are two terrific Americans and great patriots. But if you saw the things that uh, Seward said about Lincoln, or if you saw the things that Secretary Clinton said about President Obama, you know that these campaigns get very contentious. And I think the message from the president-elect is that was the campaign. That's yesterday. We have to focus on the future of America and put the right people in the right position. How are these decisions being made, Anthony? I mean, we mm -hmm. see the pictures. We see we have the camera that's sitting outside the, the mm -hmm. elevators at Trump Tower. We have the camera waiting, you know, at the golf course as well. Mm -hmm. How would they make? What okay, happens so we, when they're inside that we, door and that door is shut? We both we personally know the president elect. Okay? Yes. So we know his mannerisms, we know his personality, we know his intuition. And so there's a combination of people that he really trusts, and he's really intuitive as a person. And what he's looking for, and this is absolutely the case, are they going to serve the interests of the American people? And when I mean the American people, that means all the American people. Is this somebody that I can trust so that when I have a big decision to make, I can lean on them and they're going to tell me the truth? You know, one of the big problems with the presidency is you can get surrounded by sycophants. You've got to be very, very careful of that. And with his strong, secure personality, he wants people to tell him the truth. So that's another big factor. The third factor... Well, can, just, can I just, yeah. before, before you go sure. to that one... Did, did it matter where they were during the campaign with these people, where they were, no. as far as...
as being anti-Trump, yeah, or did it not listen, matter? Listen, I, I think he's got to put a blend in. You know, one of the big problems with Washington that is a very high immunorejection system. You could get an ornor, well, organ think donor. A Democrat. I don't know. We have to leave that up to him. I think he'd be open to just about anything that would serve the interests of the American people and make for a fantastic uh, Donald J. Trump presidency. So, but you know how Washington works. We have to have some status quo presiders mixed in with a lot of status quo disruptors so we can get the legislative agenda passed. If you put too many disruptors, you get organ rejection. If you have too many status quo presiders, then nothing changes in Washington. So, right. we so gotta he's remember. focused on it. I remember that swamp. Yeah, still needs to be drained. You're gonna drain. You look like you got still a plum you look like you got a plumber's outfit in your future, though. I can see you in the swamp draining pull, business, pull, Eric. Pull some of that. No, I can definitely see. Bear out of the yeah, no Anthony, doubt. Thank you very much. In the second unresolved problem segment tonight, Republicans and sanctuary cities. President-elect Donald Trump pledged to defund sanctuary cities during the campaign, and Republicans in Congress are already making plans to carry through on that pledge. Here's Congressman John Culberson, a Republican from Texas, on Fox this morning. If you want federal money, follow federal law. And President Trump and Attorney General Sessions, I'm confident they're going to do the same thing. And everything's now pre-positioned for New York, Chicago, California to lose their federal money. But it's their decision. If you want to protect criminal aliens, don't ask for federal money. Those days are over. And joining us now for reaction from Atlanta, Scott Miller, a Republican strategist, and from Fort Worth, Texas, Francisco Hernandez, an immigration attorney. Francisco, hello, Francisco. Hi, Mr. Mulder. Um, follow the money, right? So if you break federal law, you're a city in a state that's breaking federal law, you lose out on, the, on all those funds that the feds give to you to uh, secure your borders. If, if it were that simple, what's amazing to me is that this congressman who's in charge of spending the money doesn't know how the money is spent. The federal money that these jails or cities get are to, in fact, enforce immigration laws. It, and it's not aid like, like, uh, like welfare. It's, they have to take training. They have to do that to get the money. If we don't give them the money, then, uh, then they're not going to help immigration customs enforcement do their job. So they're paying for what they're getting. Right, right. But, Mr. Miller, th there is a way to cut off some of this additional funding that these states get that they send to these cities, right? Of course there is. And, I mean, you know, if you argue for the sovereignty of a, of a state over a city, over the federal government, then you really, I assume Francisco would leap to the defense of George Wallace when he tried to make Alabama a segregationist state. I mean, if each city can decide for itself what laws, federal laws, it's going to obey and which it's not, well, I think federal funds across the board ought to be withheld until they come <laughs> in line not. with law. Well, well look, let, me just, let me just bring this up, Mr. <laughs> Miller. So if, if a state is violating federal marijuana laws, you're not suggesting that they be some of the funding for their for their state jails and prisons and law enforcement be pulled back, do you? No, I don't. But I, don't, I, I I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I don't really understand <laughs> how those those drug laws are are applied. But I do know that immigration is a federal law, and I do know that for a city to decide that it's going to ignore a federal law uh, has to but have some kind of consequences. The city is not telling, the, telling anyone they're not following federal law. In fact, the money is designed so they will help enforce federal no, no, law. No, for Francisco, the they're breaking federal here law. Is. The law says that these local municipalities need to turn over illegals that they catch. They need to turn them over to ICE for deportation. They they're over. saying they're not going to do that. No, ICE does the holding. ICE sends a, a detainer on anybody that they believe yes, is and they undocumented. Yes, and, the the, the, and they reject ICE. They say no. no they have to give them 48 the, the, hours. Francisco, the mayors have said we're not going to turn these people over, even though ICE knows about the people who are illegal being held by these cities. You, you know what? ICE doesn't need their help. They could come in. It's federal law. They can come in and pick them up no, no matter what can't. the city or uh, the right, state listen, does. Scott, Mr. Miller, am I wrong? But they, ICE cannot go into a, into a, into a jail and grab someone out of the jail cell. No, certainly that's, can. Yeah, yes. That's not the way it works. Uh, those Just those the U.S. Marshals do every day. Run. Go ahead, Scott. Well, well, perhaps a U.S. Marshal can come in and do it. I don't think the ICE people can take it's over the same a level. police department or a, or a city jail. I mean, yes. the, the most they insane thing I heard the Francisco, other day Francisco, please, let him was Ra I, I heard Rahm Emanuel, you know, saying that, uh, you know, forever Chicago is going to be a sanctuary city. And he said, I want you people to know you're safe here. Well, hell, nobody's safe in Chicago.
Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I don't know how he made that statement, but it's just not right. But Francisco, uh, look, this is know, a at, federal at, law. Yeah, at the end, of, it is. It's a federal law, and these people what? have... And you keep thinking of Kate Steinle. It's, 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 it's a story very familiar to this show. Kate Steinle, her perpetrator of, uh, uh, of the... the, the person who killed her was caught seven times accused and convicted of felonies and he was still oh, on okay. the street because he wasn't turned but over. That's not a city's fault but the imperative information well, it is here the city's is, fault is they didn't turn him to over. Congress, we have waited 16 years to, for Congress to act. Now the Republican Party has all three, all three segments of the legislature Let's see if they're going to act. Right. Are they going to pass right. immigration reform? It's, it's bottom line. Guys, I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. This debate is certainly not over, but we have to leave it there right now. Scott and Francisco, you. thank you very much.